there is one more unit which is this sort, search and all that. Those are standard algorithms like quick sort or bubble sort. Bubble sort I think we did. So there are other sorting algorithms. <laughs> I don't know whether uh, I should explain them. I think uh, they will cover that in the class, correct? Because they are standard, there is nothing much to learn except knowing that algorithm. So there is no uh, programming which needs to be, uh, it's programming but it's a standard code. Uh, so today we will get into what is called as a linked list and uh, first I will talk about what is a linked list, then I will talk about uh, how to create a linked list and uh, there are a lot of things which we have to do with a linked list and linked list is an important topic. Even during recruitment you will find a few questions on linked list, how they work on, on doing various operations on linked list. Okay. Uh, Okay, let me first start with saying why do we need a linked list? Why is this new data structure coming? So, we have talked about an array and we have talked about a structure, correct? Now, if you visualize your array in mind and I would rather think you should think of an array of structures, right? So, if you think of an array of structures as a unit, what should come to your mind is there is a structure which contains some data then there is another structure, then there is another structure, then there is another structure. Now the problem, this approach is okay, it works, but just imagine what you would have to do is if these structures have a sequence and you want to put another structure in between, that means you have let's say employee number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now what you want to do is between 2 and 3, for whatever reason, you want to put in one more employee. What do you have to do? You would have to push all the employees after that to the right and then insert this guy in the middle. Would you agree? So, that spends a lot of time or that wastes a lot of time because pushing memory towards any direction is expensive. It takes time. Expensive means expensive in time. So, the problem with array fundamentally is that if you have to add an element somewhere in between or for that matter even if you want to remove an element somewhere in between, let us say you remove one of the elements, what do you have to do? You will have to push them to the left. So, either you have to push them to the right if you are inserting an element or you are pushing them to the left if you are removing an element in between. So, this operations of insertion into an array or deletion from an array are extremely slow operations, extremely uh, time taking, time consuming operations and that is because of the contiguous nature of an array because the way an array has to be accessed is after one index I go to the next index, after the next index I have to go to the next index. They have to be in a contiguous arrangement, that is why it is an array. And so, if you have to take away an element, per force you have to push these elements this way. Or if you have to add an element, you have to push these elements this way from the point of insertion. And as I said before, that is a very laborious, I would not say laborious, I would say tedious for sure because it takes time, uh, it takes an effort and also it takes time. I am not worried about the effort because that is programmer's responsibility, but when the code runs, it slows it down. And if you want to visualize this, you imagine I have an array of 1 billion size and you are inserting some element in the beginning, somewhere in the beginning. Can you imagine how many elements have to be pushed onto the right or if you are re removing this element, how many elements have to be pushed to the left? It is catastrophic uh, if you have to do that with an array. Uh, there are other solutions to this, but primarily an array suffers from a basic problem the problem is of contiguity. I have to maintain contiguity. So, if I have to maintain contiguity and something goes away, then this pushing backward or pushing forward becomes the issue. Arrays are good as long as you are adding data or you are changing the data. Changing data is also easy. If you want to replace the salary of a person, you directly go to that index and change the salary. Suppose I say change the salary of the 10th employee, you will say ARR of 9 dot 
sal equal to sal plus 400 or whatever. That is not very uh, difficult to do. That is a very simple update. So as far as you are updating data or you are just adding data to the end, arrays do well. But when it comes to insertions or deletions in the middle, then arrays have a serious problem. They, they cannot uh, accommodate this. So in order to avoid this problem or in order to provide a solution for this problem, we, we think of why are we in an array, what is the problem? Each guy is bound to the next guy, that next guy has to be in the next address. It has to be like that, whether it is an array of integers or an array of structures. By incrementing the pointer, you have to go to the next guy. That is fundamental. For making that happen, they have to be all contiguous in memory. So, can we relax this thing? That you have one structure here, one structure here, one structure here, one structure here and kind of connect them with some kind of a addressing scheme or pointers and then you can take away that guy or bring in that guy without too much effort. You don't have to, because they are all, instead of being tightly coupled, which is what an array does, if you keep them as a loose constellation, as a loose coupled thing, then bringing a new guy in or removing a guy in is just updating of the pointers and uh, you don't have to push memory or pull memory or anything of that kind and there lies the advantage of having a link list kind of data structure. This data structure I am talking about loosely coupling a bunch of uh, nodes or structures together, uh, not, contigu not tightly coupling like you do in an array is called a link list. So link list basically is enabling a loose coupling between the elements of that collection. So that, that is the value of a link list. Now link list is also having a lot of problems and as we move in the semesters, we will see from link list we will go to trees where the data will be organized in the form of a hierarchy, a tree. And then from trees we will go to graphs and then from graphs we will go to uh, different kinds of graphs. So the advancement of the data structure is to enable you to optimize storage of data so that insertion, deletion and updation, all of it, insertion means adding new data, deletion means getting rid of data and updation means altering data. All these operations happen without too much time. If you can design that and that is essentially design of a data structure. All data structures are evaluated from this matrix. How easy it is to insert, how easy is it to delete, how easy it is it to update and how easy is it to query. Query means retrieve. If, you, if those four measures are, are okay, then we say things are fine. And if those measures are bad, then we need to optimize. And that's where computer science people make their money by choosing the right data structure to choose. Okay. So that for a put and, and, and the right data structure changes from what kind of problem you are trying to solve, right? The problem defines the data structure, not the other way around. And that's one of the problems we find that people design a data structure in their mind and then think of the problem they solve. No. Think of the problem and then think of the data structure because data structure is your slave and uh, your algorithm has to be uh, the driving force. Whatever needs your, whatever your algorithm needs to do well, you should design the data structure accordingly. Okay. So let me just give a little bit of background and then we will start writing and designing or creating a data structure. This is just the theory behind a data structure. So I am just summarizing what I just discussed. So imagine I have an array of employees, let us pretend. So if I have an array of employees, each employee has a number, a name and let us say a salary and this guy has something 102 uh, and some salary okay, and so on and so forth. So e this is an array of structures, each is a structure, imagine that. And imagine that, so this is filled up, this is filled up, this is filled up. Uh, if I have to add something here, no problem. I just have to take the new index and do it. But if I have to add something over here, then all these guys have to be pushed ahead. Okay? And that is laborious. That is what I was talking about. Similarly, if I have to delete this guy, either that means while inserting, I have to push all these guys here or by deleting, 
I have to push all these guys to the left. Okay, that is pain. Insert, this is called tight coupling. Okay. Uh, tight coupling means they are all very closely connected to each other, like next, next, next. What is its advantage? There is a significant advantage also in an array. If you have to go from one element to the next, you can go in just I++. plus plus. If you have to go to the fifth element, you can straight away go to the fifth element. You don't need to go through all these guys, right? You just say ARR of 5, sorry, ARR of uh, 4 dot sal. You will get the fifth guy sal. If you want the seventh guy sal, just say ARR 6 dot sal and you will get the sixth, seventh guy uh, sal, right? So, that, that power is there in an array. Uh, it's very fast when you want to retrieve data or you want to update data, you directly go to the element and update it. So that's a good thing about an array because you can directly go using an index. Okay, now I'm going to give you how this would look with a loose coupling. So I would have one structure, 101, nil, 500. Okay, this is one piece of data. Then this is somewhere in memory. I really don't give a damn where it is in memory. This is in another place I have something in memory. Okay. Another employee number, employee name and salary. Yet another, let's say, employee number uh, 103, um, and let's say 900. So there are these three people who are there or there could be thousands. Now, you will say, they can't be three independent guys, right? That won't serve the purpose. So what we would need to do? We would need to kind of connect them. So, there would be a next pointer leading from here to here and then leading from here to here. So, each of these structures in addition to the data that they have, they will have this extra pointer which is called next and uh, uh, they, will, they will have, this guy will also have a next and this guy will also have a next but since he is the last guy in the chain, his next will be null. That is the meaning that this guy is the last guy in the chain. But if you see, are they contiguous in memory? No, they are not contiguous in memory. Do you agree? They are not in any way contiguous. They are wherever they are. I have full freedom to allocate them here, there and everywhere. They are like a loosely coupled group of people who have links from one guy, from the previous guy to the next guy. That guy has a link to the next guy. It is like, I know I have a pointer to you, you have a pointer to that guy, he has a pointer to that guy. That is, that is how the chain is maintained. And that's how the link list is maintained. Now you'll ask, what is so special about it? Why, why are you saying this is so good compared to this? As far as retrieval is concerned, this is very slow. Because you know, if I ask you, give me the third employee, there is no way I can go to this guy. Are you with me? You can't go, like here you can just go to this third guy and say, hey, ARR of I dot whatever, uh, you know, here is the data. Here what you'll have to do? You'll have to always, this is always maintained somewhere. This is called the head of the link list. So what I'll have to do? I'll have to start at the head. This is the first guy. This is the second guy. This is the third guy. Do you understand how slow I become? If I have to go to the third guy, I have to start from the head because this is all that is remembered. And then I, I go from here, here and here. Why can't I remember all the pointers? That would be, I can't remember 1000 pointers, right? Or 1 billion pointers, not possible. So I have to go from here to here to here. <laughs> and if you have 100 elements and you want the 95th element, you know what has to happen. You have to start from the first element, jump 95 times or 94 times before you reach the 95th element. That is very slow. Uh, so, array score when it comes to speed. But, what is a good advantage here? Let's say I want to put an employee between 102 and 103. I want to put another employee. Let's say 110 uh, Gopal and salary of 1100. And I want to put him in between. For whatever reason. He has to come in that sequence. Okay. Or let's say his, his number is 4 and this guy's number is 3, whatever. I, I don't know why the reason is, but I want this guy to come in between. 
Now, in case of an array, if I have to put a guy in between, I have to push a lot of guys ahead and that is slow. Here, if this guy has to come in between, it's a very simple operation. What I have to go? To the, the previous guy's next has to be altered to only point here. And this guy's next has to be pointed to this. So instead of this pointer, a little play with the pointers, that is, the previous guy's next pointer should point to him. This guy's next pointer should point to the previous guy's next. Correct? So, this is the previous guy's next, no? This is the previous guy. So, anyway, you will understand how what it means. But by simple manipulation of little pointer, so I have to first create this guy and just manipulate the pointers, change the pointers, which is a very simple operation. doesn't take too long. And uh, then I can put this guy in between. It doesn't take too much effort. I don't have to push many guys in between, right? I, as long as I locate this guy, I, I go there and after that I don't have to shove people ahead or anything. I'm not doing anything. I just alter the next pointer. That's it. And I am done. Okay. If I have to get rid of a guy, let's say I want to get rid of this guy. Okay. What do I have to do? His previous guy is next. Okay. I just have to bypass this guy. And I am, he is out of the game. Correct? I just have to bypass. So what I have to do? This guy is next which is leading here who has to go away. Now, his next, if it points here and I somehow deallocate this guy, he is gone. Are you with me? No? Yes? So he goes out of the game. It is very easy to kick people out of the game and very easy to bring new people into the game. Into the game means into the list. Uh, how do you kick people out? Go to the previous guy, just alter his next pointer to point to the guy who is going out, his next pointer, correct? What, wherever it was pointing to. So, the guy who is going out in this case was 102, 102's next, wherever it is going, becomes 101's next. Agreed? Just that and that guy is kicked out. So, I just have to create a bypass. And, and that guy goes out of the game. And if I have to insert, just the reverse. Create this guy. Yes. And then once you have created this guy, he's, the previous guy is next. Should lead to this guy. Instead of leading to the next one. And this guy is next. Should lead to the previous guy is next. Earlier previous guy is next. Correct? No? Yes? Simple. You just have to do that. So, getting new guys into the game or getting guys out of the game becomes extremely trivial. No pushing of memory, no pulling of memory, nothing of that kind. You don't have that overhead at all. You just go to the right guy, take him out or take him in. Okay? And just tra one traverse is enough. Uh, no movement of memory is necessary as, as it is in case of an array when you want to insert an update. So, in simple steps, simple one, one line or two lines, I would use an array. So, this, this quandary, this, this debate is always there in people's mind. For this particular problem in order to store data in memory, should I employ an array or should I engage a list? How do you decide? Answer is very obvious. Do you do updates more often and queries more often? Query means retrieval more often. Then use array. If you are going to do insertions or deletions in between, then don't use an array. Look at a linked list. Correct? Very, very simple. Because you know, adding new guys, very easy. Just create somebody somewhere, just manipulate the pointers and you are done. No pushing of memory, no pulling of memory. So, these are the criteria which should pass in your mind. You should ask, your application is needing what? Updating or query or lot of insertion delete? If it needs everything, then the choice is yours. I mean, if the application has enough inserts, equal number of deletes, equal number of retrievals, equal number of updates, then the choice, that means both, both criteria are balanced, then maybe I would use an array. <laughs> I mean, or I would use a linked list. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter because both, both are going to suffer. Okay. Uh, so, this is basically a linked list. Now, before we start creating linked list and working with linked list, we are now going to do something which we have delayed so far. 
which is allocating memory on demand. Okay, so first we'll do that, and then we will see how to work with linked list because linked list needs dynamic memory allocation. Remember, so far many of our problems, almost all our problems, we have created a big array and then used part of an array. Correct. So before we go to linked list, I'm going to talk about first today. If you have to get a good grip on memory allocation, okay, memory allocation for a structure, memory allocation for an array on demand, not like what we were trying to do, declare a big one, use a small part of it, that is stupid. We should be able to get memory on demand, okay. On that, so I am going back a little, I will first talk about dynamic memory because you need lot of it before you can work with a list. Uh, so we will, so as a, as a side bar, we will talk about uh, dynamic memory allocation. Okay. Before that, let us uh, talk about the difference between static memory and dynamic memory and because we need it for our list and other things. So let me just talk about this. What happens if I say int ARR 10? It is an integer array, it does not matter what kind of array. What happens? Whether I like it or not, how many, how much of memory is allocated? 10 integers, whatever the 10 integers may be, assuming that each integer is 4 bytes and uh, you can do that, right? 40, okay? The other way to do, which some people do is, if they want to allocate n bytes, uh, n elements, they do this. Yes, no. Now, this is a little dangerous. A, it is non-standard. I know it works, but it is non-standard. And what is the problem here? The problem here is, again, you may not still need N. Just because the user says N, you are taking N. This is still a static memory allocation. Don't think it is dynamic memory because this value of N has to be known before this line. Are you with me? I can't do this line unless I know n is equal to something. Either, either I have done a scanf or I have done an assignment or something to n. I can't do this. This is really, so, so a lot of people think this is dynamic memory. This is not dynamic memory. Dynamic memory is something which you allocate based on a requirement which may be in the form of array or it may be in the form of anything else and which can change at will. Right now n is there, that much is allocated whether you like it or not. How do you de deallocate it? How do you give it back? So dynamic memory allocation needs an ability to acquire memory and also to relinquish the memory when I don't need it. Because in any big program that you write, you will ever write, you will be creating memory at a particular time, using it for some time and then giving it up. Now here, this memory you can't give it up. Whatever you have given with that n, you have allocated, you can't give it, give it up. Imagine one time I need an array of 10 elements. Next time I need the same array but of 20 elements. What will I do? Should I take another array of 20 elements? Because I don't need the first array. Are you getting me? I need to give up that first array. I don't want that. I want another array of 20. Or after a little later I want some other array of some other size. So I should be able to give back the previous array and get a new array. With this you can't get a new array. Or rather you can get a new array but you can't give back that earlier array. There is no provision because you don't have a handle. Uh, and it has not come from the static pool of memory. This, uh, Sorry, it has come from the static pool of memory. It has not come from the dynamic pool of memory. Okay, I think I should go back a little. Okay, let me step back one more step. There are two pools of memory generally. Okay, Pool of memory means memory from which you get allocated. One pool of memory is called the stack. It is on the stack. So when I say int ARR10, I am doing a static memory all allocation. May come from the stack or may come from the static pool. So let us keep the stack aside. Let us talk about static pool. Now the static pool is limited. And you have to also realize that if I give an array which is very big, let us say 1 billion, and I can't get it, then the program itself won't start. Because the program necessitates 
that before I start, I need to allocate that much memory. Imagine instead of 10, I have put 1 billion there and there, there isn't that much memory. Will that program start? It won't start. Now, that is a problem with static memory that it is allocated at the time the program is triggered. You need that much memory. Otherwise, your program won't, won't commence. So, uh, if I ask even the second line, it is also taking static memory. It is taking at a different point, okay? Uh, when after the n is there. But the memory is coming from the static pool. You don't conclude that this memory is dynamic because it's not coming from the dynamic pool. It is allocated at a later time, but it is still allocated from the static pool. The A10, first line is allocated in the beginning itself. Second one is allocated a little later when you get the value of n. But please remember, it is coming from the same pool. The problem with the static pool is, it's a one-way street. One-way street means you can only acquire memory from that. You cannot relinquish the memory. So if you go on acquiring, sooner or later, though you don't need the memory, there is no way you can give it back. So soon the static pool will get exhausted and you won't have enough memory to do work. You can't keep on allocating. Or then, otherwise you have to reuse this memory again and again, which becomes difficult from a programming perspective. Okay? So, we generally don't like people allocating memory like this. This is, okay, you have been doing it for, for so long and uh, uh, we have, we, because we are doing with the other part of the program, but any seasoned programmer, if he looks at these two lines, he will say, oh, this guy is not yet ripened, you know, not yet mature. Because static pool memory generally is, is uh, uh, cumbersome because you don't know A, how much to allocate, you don't know how much of it is going to be utilized and B, when you don't need it, you have no way of giving it back. That is the problem with static memory. So nobody who is a professional programmer will either write that line or that line. Both these lines, a professional will never write. Okay. We will soon see in a moment how a professional will write. Professional will say how much memory you want. That much I will get. Not 10, not N. N is better than 10, but N is also not having the ability to give back. Okay. So now I am going to create first an array of memory dynamically and then we are going to see how to give it back and then how to allocate it differently and <laughs> let's, let's work with it. So let's write a small program, what are we going to call it? Is everybody understanding what we are trying to do? We, are, we don't want now anything like int ARR 10 or versions of that. Get that firmly in your mind. Why? Two reasons. You may underutilize it, overutilize it and there is no way of giving it back. So you don't know about the utilization and you have no mechanism to Return it back to the pool when you don't need it, okay? Whenever you want to allocate a data structure, an array, don't allocate it blindly as 100 or 10 or 50. Ask the user how much and then allocate it accordingly. It could be an array, it could be anything, okay? So let me talk about it. Hash include stdio.h. These libraries keep changing, so <laughs> some of it will come through which compiler you are using. Okay. So, yeah, uh, hash include stdio.h, stdlib.h. Okay. Now we have main. Okay. Now I want to create an array of n elements. So I will let's say declare an n, take an n from the user, printf give the size of the array uh, scan fn is this clear so far there's nothing which i have done <laughs> so i am reading n now I'll allocate an array of n using dynamic memory allocation, not static pool allocation. Okay. Is it okay? So for dynamic memory allocation, 
there is a special call called Malloc. You better get familiar with Malloc. Uh, he is going to be your friend for quite some time. Malloc and New, whatever. For 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 the one of the reasons why C survives in one of their domains, which is called embedded programming and all that, where you want to write code on a device, is primarily because of its malloc and free ability. C gives you a lot of control over management of memory, which languages like Python or languages like uh, uh, even JavaScript don't have. JavaScript has, unless if you know JavaScript pretty deep, there are ways of creating what are called type arrays, where they control the memory and all. You know, all this control of memory comes useful, not so much in laptop programming or GPU programming or anywhere. It becomes issue when you are programming on a resource constrained device, like you are writing code or for a washing machine, or you are writing code which sits on an uh, umbrella. You know, you want to build a intelligence into an umbrella. Then you need C. Because then you need tight control on your memory. You, you will have an umbrella. You remember umbrella, its handle. How much memory can it have? At the most, you can put a knob. In that knob, you can put a small microprocessor. On that, you have to write some code which sits. Correct? On an SD card or something. So if you have to write that kind of code, you can't be generous, you know, allocate 100, 200, you can't do that. You have to manage your memory, take it when you need it, give it up when you don't need it. You have to be very careful with your memory orchestration or memory management. That C gives you the most, okay. Uh, the other language which somewhat gives you something there is C++, but then that is C only. I mean, <laughs> C and C++ are same, right. Uh, in whatever you can do in C, you can do in C++, not vice versa, okay. So we are going to use malloc to allocate memory, okay. See the way I do it. Malloc is a very simple call, uh, but some people don't understand it till the end of their life. So malloc takes only one parameter, how much memory you want me to give in bytes. And the only problem with malloc which makes it little difficult to understand is malloc always gives a pointer to a void. It says, I'll give a void star. It never gives a int star or any other star. So we have to carry out what is called as a casting. Okay, Casting means type casting. You'll see both because I didn't bring in those ideas till we need it. Uh, so we will see now how to do that. Now I need n integers. You agree? So let me construct a malloc because we are doing it very uh, simply first. Let me just write malloc first, but it's not correct. We'll correct it as we go. So we'll say malloc. Okay, nobody says it like this. We'll correct it as we go. Malloc. What should malloc do? Allocate memory in bytes. Yes, no? How much memory should it allocate in bytes? Size of int into n. You are with me? Logically, at least you know. Size of int will give you the size of an integer into n because I want an array of n integers. So I will say size of int into n. Does everybody agree with my parameter? No? Yes? That much memory I want because that is the array I want to use. Yes? But as I told you, everybody clear right on the parameter? I am asking for that much memory. So I got that much memory let us say. In fact after every malloc you should check whether you got that much memory or not. But let us not bother about that. It, like null. Like fp is equal to f open. After that you have to check whether fp is null or not. I am not checking. So uh, malloc gives me that memory. But as I said, malloc has this small quirk that it allocates a wide pointer. Whereas I want an array. Array is nothing but an integer pointer. Correct? When you say int arr10, another way of looking at arr is an integer pointer, right? We talked about it. The name of the array is the address of the first element. So ARR is a pointer. Also it's an array, but it's a pointer. Name of an array is always a pointer to the first element. We know that. So look at the way uh, we will cast it. We'll declare int star ARR. I can't put a square bracket now because the moment I say square bracket, it will last something in that square bracket, correct? 
Yes, no? I, I don't know what to put in that square bracket because I'm reading n later. Yeah? So I don't know what to put in the square bracket, so I've treated the pointer version of the array, which I'm saying in star ARR. Right? Then I'll say, look at my line. ARR equal to, now on my left, left of that equal to, what is there on the left? It's an in star. Yes? On the left is it an in star? So, ARR is on my left. What is getting allocated on the right? On the right there is void star. On the left there is in star. All of you agree? Malop gives you a void star and ARR is giving you, I mean we have declared it as int star. So, the conversion from one type to another type is called casting. This is a generic word, not C word. This is all over computer science, we call it casting. Casting means converting from one type to another type. So, that is called type casting or casting. Okay. So, now we have to cast. How do you cast? You have to put a bracket, two parentheses, so and say int star. So what you are doing is, what you are doing is, malloc is giving me a void pointer. I am casting it into a integer pointer because array arr is an integer pointer. Do you understand the justification for the cast? You have to do it. Otherwise, your compiler will give you an error saying here you have a void, here you have an int, uh, here you have a void star, here you have an int star. I can't do this, correct? I will not allow this to happen, right? So, ARR is equal to int star malloc size of int into n, okay? Done? Everybody agrees? So, this is how I get a integer pointer, ARR, of size n. Now, I can use it as an array. Yes? So, let's use it as an array to read about n elements. So, for i equal to 0, i less than n, i equal to i plus 1, okay. for i equal to 0, i less than n, i is equal to i plus 1, what do I do? Let us say scan f, I will use it as an array, scan f. Uh, percentage D ampersand of ARR I ARR of I or you can use a pointer version just say ARR plus I that also you can do that is equivalent right because ARR of I can always be translated into ARR plus I star of ARR plus I correct so you can always get that so we are doing ampersand arri we are treating it as an element and reading it in and then we can display it just to as an example we are just creating an array dynamically and now we will print it we will just print it nothing else ok so printf we remove the ampersand yeah ok now what are we doing? We are doing some interesting things in the program. We are reading n from the user. Then we are dynamically allocating memory on line 9 for that array. It is not statically created, remember. It is dynamically created. Okay. Now, the moment it is dynamically created, I am getting ARR, which I can treat either as a pointer or as an array. And uh, then we have reading in the data of that array that many elements and then displaying them, that is all. Now, what the program will work right now, okay? but it has a serious flaw. It will work, I am not questioning, I am not uh, saying it won't work, it will work perfectly, whatever you have read, it, it will display, it will do all that. But this program as it stands, as it stands right now in front of you, has a serious bug or a serious flaw. Can anyone tell me? Beautiful. That is the problem. See, static arrays have one advantage. They are taken at the run time, are taken at the program start time and automatically they are given back to the static pool. They are reclaimed by the static pool. Okay. 
Are you with me? I allocate it by saying int ARR 100, whatever we did. I don't have to worry about deallocating because once it's allocated, it will live with me till the end of my program. And when my program has ended, automatically the operating system will take that back from me. I don't have to do any special thing for uh, giving it back. It will automatically, once it will remain till my program remains. Sorry, it will remain till my program runs. The moment my program stops, it's ended, this automatically will go back. If I declare int ARR 100, that is static memory allocation, right? Or int ARR n, whatever. In this case, I have demanded and got memory on demand on line 9. I have asked for the memory, okay? So, now it is my responsibility to give it back. The compiler or the operating system will not take it back. What will happen if I write a program like this is, this memory which I have allocated, after the program ends, that memory will be allocated from the dynamic pool, that chunk of memory. There won't be any pointer to it. It will just remain with a flag allocated. So your pool of memory will shrink by that much. You are with me? Because I have not given it back. I have just taken it. Automatically, dynamic memory doesn't go back. You have to give it up. You have to ask it on demand and it is your responsibility to give it back also. If you don't give it back, it remains allocated even your program has finished and often people get this problem. They run their program 10 times because there is a bleed. This is called a memory bleed. Right now, the program has a memory bleed. So, I am bleeding memory, that means I am taking the memory, forgetting to give it back, asking it to reclaim, no, no reclamation happens. So what happens if this program run, let's say 20 times, you have 20 pockets of memory, yes, allocated, but never returned back to the pool, never reclaimed back by the operating system. Operating system is the final owner of the memory, it never went back, because I never said, take it back. I only, one way street, I only took it back, took it from the operating system, but I never asked the operating system, I am giving it back to you, reclaim it. That is, I no longer need it. What happens is, this often gets reported like this. It ran, uh, it was running just now, it stopped running. What stopped running? Your program stopped running. Why did it stop running? Because suddenly after some time, let's say it has been running for many days and it is having this kind of bleed, the problem doesn't get reported immediately. After several days, when it has reclaimed, it is taking memory and not giving it back, soon, depending on the hard disk of your system, the, it says, oh, no more memory. Then it suddenly one day starts running. Because, not because anything is wrong with your code or logic. Simply, it's basically, I have not given, returned back the memory. This is called a memory bleed. Some people call it a dangling pointer. Dangling pointer means... I have a pointer to some memory which is going nowhere. I mean, uh, okay, let's not bring dangling pointer yet. It is just that I have taken memory and I have a memory bleed because I have not, memory bleed or memory leak, whatever, because I have not given back that dynamic memory. This is the danger of dynamic memory. You have to get it and you have to relinquish it. You have to release it. Here I have taken it, but I am not bothered to release it. Now, most of the programmers will make this mistake. Not in this code, but because they will be taking memory often, they will forget to give it back and their program is working, they are happy. In a few days when they keep running the program periodically, the memory bleed catches up and stops your program running because after that there is no more memory to give and the program bombs out. Right? Now, to avoid this problem, earlier, we used to tell the programmers, when the programmers are taught programming, that whenever you take dynamic memory, be careful that, you know, dynamic memory has to be given back. It has to be returned by a free. Okay, so to just take care, let's see what I have to do. I have to come down. After I am done with the memory, you have to decide when you don't need that memory. You have to say free ARR. Whatever the pointer which you got, you need to release it. Are you with me? If you forget to do this, it won't show up error now. 
these errors are notoriously difficult to debug and one of the prime reasons people don't like C, C++ move to more okay now let me talk about are you clear about this problem are you clear that there might be a memory bleed in your program because in real life you will not write programs so simple where there is a clear malloc and then there is a, an absent free so immediately you can correct it often function will call function function will call function that function will take memory then it will come out so the memory is taken somewhere and then uh, based on that some other memory has been created some other data has been created some other values have been created and then uh, un unless you are very careful and very smart you you forget you know whether i have to release it or somebody else has to release it okay and that is a very serious problem both with c as well as c++ so instead of that to avoid that problem in languages like java and python and all these they have what is called in the jvm their, their, their system is called the java virtual machine or in your dalvik which runs on your android or or the ios which runs on your on your iphone uh, you have this thing called garbage collector so they have a built in garbage collector so what is the job of the garbage collector it's a special process which runs on your system behind the scenes background he is looking for all such memories which don't have any pointer that is what uh, uh, it is looking for all orphaned memory in computer science terms later we will learn this is called eligible memory eligible for collection garbage collection so there is imagine there are these pockets of memory which programmers have left without relinquishing it and there is this nice guy called garbage collector who once in a while goes through the entire memory scans memory looking for such pockets which have not been freed and how does it do it we'll talk when we discuss java so it looks at that memory and says oh this memory has been left orphaned there's no pointer to it so it will just it's just hanging there it takes that and adds it to the pool that is reclaims that memory and it keeps doing that on a regular basis okay so periodically the jvm will run now the problem with that is so you will say oh this is beautiful that means i i don't have to care about memory in fact in java there is no free they said you don't free you take what you want freeing i'll take care are you with me you don't bother about freeing okay we will the garbage collector will get invoked and it will get called and it will reclaim the memory you don't bother about however thinking deeper this is one of the problems of java you will say why this doesn't seem like a problem this seem like a manna from heaven uh, it is doing something for me the garbage collector is coming periodically and it is taking away my unclaimed uh, uh, sorry unfreed memory and it is adding to the pool but there in lies a rub there in lies a problem with java you know why anybody this is a good thing the garbage collector is there is a good thing memory Some, sometimes necessary memory can sometimes no no it will never if it will not claim memory which you have a use of it it will watch memory which is not being used that only it will reclaim no don't worry about the <laughs> i am taking he is taking no it won't happen like that unless you have unless you have no pointer to it only then it will reclaim it sir suppose uh, we have initialized a pointer uh, to a certain uh, we have only initialized it and not given it any value hmm. still it collects away that memory no it won't do that unless you have it sees that there is no nobody accessing that memory it will take it only then ah how you are going on a right track how it periodically checking the uh, memory ah. so it takes time to check the memory yes so good good yes i got it right problem is in performance what happens is because this periodic guy keeps coming in let's write let's say we are writing a program for a missile launch or for a space launch we are writing program for things which have to happen then only 
and then only. Are you with me? Now, how do I say then only and then only? It means that if this trigger has to be pressed or this firing has to be done, it has to be done at the third second point zero zero exactly. Are you with me? So I set up my timer in my program to go at 3.00 at that point. I set up my timer in my program. Now, in C, because there is no background guy going, yes, there is a semblance of predictability that when 3.00 happens, my missile will fire or some circuit will trigger. Correct? But if you write the same code in Java, what may happen is, you never know because it's all happening behind the scene. At 2.95, Mr. Garbage Collector will start working. So what will happen? He says, no, 3.0, I am in action. I will reclaim memory. You, you tell, get out. No, I am there. I will do my work. Are you with me? Did you understand? Yes, sir. So it may happen. You don't know when it will happen. It's a periodic task which is set by its own cycle. So he will say, I am coming in, you stop. At that time, garbage collector was in action. So 3.00 couldn't happen. Because you don't know how much memory he is going to reclaim depends on state of the program. That is a problem with Java. You cannot do real-time application. This is a real-time application. It has to happen at that time only. It cannot be one second before, one nanosecond before or one nanosecond later. It has to be crystal clear at that time only and nothing else. With garbage collector in action, though he is doing a good job, he will have no control because he is coming on his own, reclaiming memory and going away. You cannot say with a semblance of guarantee or predictability that he won't be called. He may be called anytime. So for that reason, people don't prefer Java for business critical applications, right? Or real time applications. They don't like that. Nobody writes code in Java for the core missile technology or the core signal processing stuff. Okay. So that is a problem. Compared to that, this is a better approach. But here you have to be careful. Obviously, that kind of code is written by smarter people. So they will not make errors like bleeding memory. So they will manage memory well. And there are today a lot of tools also, third party tools. If you give them a program, they will analyze the program for you. You don't have to do it. It's an automated tool. It will analyze the program for you and tell you, ah, there seems to be a memory bleed in your problem. Please correct it. They will also point out. They use a bit of AI also. So they point out, at this point, there perhaps is some kind of a memory bleed. Of course, it's an indication. There's no certainty there. But it gives you a hint to a developer, Are, I have to be careful. Maybe I'm, I'm goofing up my, my memory here. So then he becomes careful and does it. Of course, those are tricks you will learn down the road. And uh, you know that, that's, that's the care that you have to take with this kind of memory. You have to be sure to give it up. Okay. Uh, okay. So we have allocated an array, created an array, allocated memory dynamically and giving it back. Okay. So we will, okay. We'll run it now just to show that it's working. You can also check it. There's nothing very, I has to be declared. Five. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. Yeah. We didn't give a space in between. Understood? Are we clear what we are doing? Format doesn't matter. Yes. So we are getting memory. We are giving back memory, we are getting as much as we want, giving back as much as we want. Are we clear about the use of malloc and free? Now if I am allocating a structure here, which we will soon do, uh, okay, can we go back to code? Okay, suppose I have to allocate memory for a uh, structure, let's say five structures. How will your malloc change? Are you understanding what I am saying? I want to allocate memory for five structures. Each structure is an employee, let's say. 
ah, size of struct EMP. So in, in place of size of int, in place of that int, what will you say? Struct, whatever the name of your struct, employee, student, whatever name you have created for your structure, that you have to mention there. Is it okay? And then you can allocate an array by saying into n. Yes? And what should your casting be? We will do that in a moment, but what should your cast be? Here you converted into an integer pointer. Remember malloc whether you like it or not always gives a wide pointer. Now in this case what you will have to do? You casted it into an integer pointer in the present example. In this example where I want to allocate an array of structures, how will I cast it? I can't say int star, right? In that line, which line is that? 9. I can't say insta, I don't want an integer pointer, I want a structure, employee structure pointer. So I'll have to say struct m star. Are you with me? No, yes. Let's do it once just to, let's create one more example. So we'll allocate a, a data for three employees or four employees, whatever. And just to ensure that you are on the, confident with that. So, okay. If you don't include a std lib, you will get a warning or you may get an error, depends on your compiler. Okay. So, struct emp, okay. int, no, char ename, let us have three fields only. Car e name uh, 20, uh, int h and float sal. Okay, we will have three fields only. You can have 30 if you want, but that is okay. Yeah, so now we will ask the user. How many employees he needs? Printf, enter number of employees. Okay. And uh, yeah, so he will say scanf percentage d and percent of n done. Okay. So so we got n. Ah, now comes the point, I want to create an array of employees, so I will call it ARR. How should I declare it? I will declare it at the top using, I am, remember I am going to treat it as an array, but I am using the pointer notation. So I will say struct m, struct m star ARR. I am going to create a array of employees, whatever number you want, you are with me? No, yes. I declared it as an array, I will create that array depending on the number of employees, okay? So which I am asking, okay? Then what I will do is, now I have ERR and I have to allocate memory. I now have N with me. How many employees are there? I have asked the user on demand and I have got N. Yes. So now I have to allocate memory. I will say ERR equal to, oh, you need to help me with this. What will I say now? First, let us put the cast because malloc will return a void pointer. So I will cast it into an employee pointer. Struct EMP, EMP is the name of the structure, star, star. Are you with me? Struct EMP star. That is a pointer has to be converted into an employee pointer. Obviously, it will point to the first employee, right? Then, okay, now malloc, malloc, okay. yeah, can you help me with the parameter? Size of struct EMP. That will give me the size of one employee. Yes. 
So size of struct employee, M, sorry. This internal size of, do you know size of is a built in. That's why it appears in that color. Okay. So size of struct TMP will give me one employee. How many do I want? I want N. So what will I say? Size of struct employee star N. Is it clear? Is everybody clear about my malloc please? That is the important line. Yes. Malloc casting first. How much memory? Size of struct employee that is one employee into N. That much memory I want. I, that much of dynamic memory I want. I am getting it. Of course, I, I am not making the check. Please remember. <laughs> After every malloc in good code, you should check whether that pointer came or not or is it null. Because I might have asked for too much memory and there is not that much memory to give. So, uh, we will get the memory. Correct? So, ERR now can be treated as an array. Remember, pointer and array are duals of each other. Right? So, now I can write a for loop for i equal to 0 i less than n i equal to i plus 1 ah. now I can read all the data about the employees so I can say ah. open bracket I can say scan f yes yeah you can ask give the name and all that ok let us do that uh, printf enter name ok then scanf percentage s comma err of i now I can treat it as an array err of i dot s name s name is already s name or e name e name uh, e name is an array so I do not have to say ampersand correct yes no I got the name. Similarly, I can get the age and salary. We will just copy that. Enter age ampersand percentage D, yes. Ampersand of Age is a single field, not an array. ERR of age, correct? Yeah. Enter salary. Percentage F of sal and percent. Are we done? This will read the salary, right? Does everybody have this code? Yes, sir. Okay. I will give you a couple of minutes, maybe five minutes. Complete the code to give me the maximum salary. Understood? No, yes. Give me the name of the guy. Name. I want the name of the guy who has the highest salary. Just write code there. Just write a small loop after this. Do not include it in this loop please because otherwise you will judge it now only. No. I want you to process the loop. Do not write it in this loop. Write a separate loop. Imagine there is an employee array and find out the name of the guy with the highest salary. Display the name of the guy with the highest salary. Write the logic for that. You will also have to use perhaps strcpy, copy strings. So if you do not know how to use it, just go to Google, stay strcpy. You will need it at some point. You have a for loop and you have this. Anybody done? Highest salary, name of the person. Okay, good. Name of the person with the highest salary. I want the name. I do not want the highest salary. You might want to use strcpy. Okay, let's do it. Int comma. Now declare one.
float msal that is what we'll need plus we'll have to remember the oh if you remember the index it's okay so we'll say m index oh you don't need strcp by index m index int m index okay you know why i'm using these two variables m sal to remember the highest salary m index to remember the index the array index of the guy with the highest salary is that okay when i find something bigger i'll do that so i'll initialize m sal to a very low number which is zero and m index will obviously be zero also is that okay I am initializing both m sal to zero and m index to zero. Then what will I do? Then I'll go through the loop for i equal to zero, i less than n. It's a very simple loop. i equal to zero, i less than n, i equal to i plus one. If e r r of i sal greater than m sal greater than m sal then i do two things m sal is equal to err i of sal dot sal and m index semicolon m index equals i that's it and then i can print it that's all i need isn't it i have to just remember the index of the guy who is who is the highest guy so how do i do i go through the entire for loop i check i have initialized m sal to 0 and m index also to 0 so i say if err i dot sal is greater than m sal if this condition is true that means i have got a guy whose salary is higher than the current m sal then i update my m sal equal to err i dot sal i change my m sal to that sal because i always want to pick the biggest guy and then i say i remember the index of the guy who gave me the current highest salary uh, which is m index now i am done with the for loop then i come down and say print f the guy the the highest paid person is the highest paid person equal to percentage s err of err of m index that index dot e name huh dot e name enough na huh? i'll say err of m index dot e name m index is the index of the guy and what do i want from that employee record i want the name or e name whatever the name of that field i want that so let's see whether this works for us we'll run it sam uh, 7000 anyway from the data point of view whatever data it is okay so the name of the person is ram which is correct clear okay understood so this is how you work with dynamic memory allocation we have not gone into linked list yet but this was a necessary step we had to understand how to do dynamic memory allocation because without that you can't do linked list okay so we'll stop here for today so next week we'll go into deeper of linked list